Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and will be available uh, on our website um, within the next day or two um, for you all to access if you would like to revisit anything. And then also any supporting materials uh, will be shared uh, with everyone uh, after uh, the webinar. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar uh, with our organization, so we are the California School Business Health Alliance. Uh, we're the statewide nonprofit um, that's dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in school. And so we do that um, in a variety of ways. So um, the California School Based Health Alliance provides uh, technical assistance. Uh, we also do policy advocacy. Uh, but uh, we uh, do a lot of work with school based centers uh, across the state of California um, and provide support in uh, operations, a startup, uh, programming, et cetera. Um, and so youth engagement um, is one of the many things um, that uh, the California School Based Health Alliance uh, provides uh, support with. To learn more about our work, you can visit us on our website at schoolhealthcenters.org. Uh, we also invite you all uh, to become a member if you aren't one already. Um, by becoming a member, you get access to exclusive benefits, uh, which includes uh, our discount to our annual uh, conference. Uh, this year, we will be hosting it virtually, um, so stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, you also get access to a variety of tools and resources, um, including our Youth Health Worker curriculum, which may be of interest to folks on the call. Uh, and uh, you also do get some access uh, to technical assistance um, in the form of uh, school based health center startup, operations, youth engagement programming, et cetera. Um, you can uh, use the link there on the screen uh, to sign up. Uh, there are different um, membership tiers that you can sign up for either as an individual or as an organization. Um, also, I do want to bring your attention um, to our ongoing telehealth webinar series. Some of you may have participated um, in former webinars um, that we've hosted as part of the series. Uh, but uh, we do have other webinars coming up that may be of interest for you um, or your organization as well. Um, so this info will be shared uh, with you all uh, at the end of the webinar as well. Uh, but we encourage you to uh, join these webinars uh, if any of our of our interest to you. So with that, I'm really excited uh, by the panel uh, that we have today. Um, so we are joined by two organizations today. Um, so first, uh, we have uh, panelists from the uh, Los Angeles Department for Children's Health. Um, so I would like to um, first introduce um, Danielle Griffith. Uh, she has done extensive work on engagement uh, for about six years now yeah. um, and has been um, with the trust uh, for about a year. Uh, also, we are joined by Mackenzie Scott, who uh, is the engagement program coordinator uh, with the LA Trust. Uh, she is uh, a lady that uh, currently resides in Los Angeles. Um, she also has extensive experience um, working with young people. Um, and we're also uh, joined by uh, Robert Renteria, uh, who is the program manager uh, with the LA Trust. Um, and so with that, um, I will uh, pass it off to Danielle to kick us off. Actually, I'll go ahead and uh, take over. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you to the uh, State Alliance for inviting us to this webinar. Um, I just want to give a couple of slides with a little bit of background information on the Los Angeles Trust and a little bit of information on the programs. So many of you know us. We're a really big strategic partner with the State Alliance. Uh, the LA Trust was fund founded in 1991 to help support and develop um, LUSD health programs. Um, our brand new mission is to uh, bridging the world of health and education to achieve student wellness. Our brand new vision 
uh, statement is a world where every student is healthy and successful and our brand new strategic goals include uh, to promote student health through prevention and education, to transform student healthcare with data-driven insights. So a lot of you know about our new uh, data exchange, which is connecting uh, clinic information uh, with academic information from the students in LUSD. Um, our next strategic goal is to foster best practices and provide support to uh, school-based wellness, which is partially what we're doing today. And lastly, uh, to strengthen infrastructure and to expand uh, influence and impact. Next slide. Um, so a little bit of backdrop on the wellness network. Um, we uh, currently have 16 wellness centers. Um, we just added a brand new wellness center, Santee, uh, this last semester. Um, they're established in high priority geographic areas. So basically a lot of those uh, public health maps that we're oh too familiar with around um, public health disparities, uh, those were used to uh, help locate the wellness centers in certain schools. Uh, we work with 12 different uh, community health centers and federally qualified health centers or FQHCs to operate the wellness centers uh, and they're open to both students and the surrounding community. Uh, the wellness centers offer all sorts of uh, FQHC services, which include sexual reproductive health, uh, physical screenings, immunizations, mental health services, and some have oral or dental services as well. Uh, because of COVID-19, some sites have been closed and have been referring clients to their main sites um, or adapted their hours to better serve the community. Uh, some are also uh, practicing telehealth. So for a snapshot around our student engagement program, uh, most sites have a student advisory board. Um, the uh, 12 sites are run by volunteers. So these are basically professionals that have other job responsibilities. They're either teachers, administration, or clinic staff. And three sites currently are run by allies that are LA Trust employees. So obviously this is um, Jordan and Locke with Danielle and uh, Crenshaw that is run by McKenzie. Um, our student advisory boards run a total of five health awareness campaigns that include um, HPV awareness, STD testing and prevention, healthy eating active living or HEAL, and tobacco prevention and substance use prevention as well. Uh, traditionally, students meet weekly to organize campaigns such as tabling events, uh, ca uh, campus activities, health fairs, and education sessions. Um, now I'd like to introduce Danielle and Mackenzie each of them uh, will uh, provide a backdrop of how their student engagement programs were functioning uh, before the COVID restrictions took place, what hurdles they had to go through, and uh, the best practices that they came up with. Um, the, we'll also be hearing some student voices uh, from their respective campuses. So I'll go ahead and pass it on to Danielle. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. So first I'll be talking about the student engagement work we did in real life before COVID-19 and then I'll go into the post COVID-19 work. So I have two student advisory boards at two different high schools in Watts, South LA. The groups consist of 10 students each and their primary purpose is to promote school, the school based health center on campus, which is our what we call a wellness center um, and to promote overall health. In order to hold students accountable to actually participating, we offer them a stipend each semester of $150 that is decreased in accordance to their attendance. Um, like Robert mentioned earlier, each site has its own grant deliverables and students have a budget that I help, well, myself and Mackenzie help them manage. Uh, my students and I, we meet once a week to plan our events and our campaigns. When planning campaigns and events, the first step uh, we do is to choose a health topic. We try to align ourselves with whatever is being promoted statewide and nationwide. So for example, May was Mental Health Awareness Month and Teen Pregnancy Prevention Month. So students were able to choose between the two or they could come up with their own campaign if they want. Um, after we choose the health topic, we ask our partners to come in and train the students on the topic they chose. Then when the students feel comfortable talking about the topic, uh, we begin step two, which is the planning and advertising process. Uh, this is mostly just a lot of brainstorming and logistics, like finding a day, time, and location. 
What they'll do to advertise is usually in classroom presentations, posts on social media, posters around campus, and communicating with their teachers about what they're up to at the time. During the events, they'll pair their tabling activity with an activity to draw attention from their peers, and they'll also give out stuff like gift cards to Nike, candy, chips, swag. We do try to opt for the healthy version, uh, but sometimes it is fun just to give them candy because it's what they're into. And just to give you guys a little bit more context on the pictures, the upper right was a lunchtime activity my students held where they raffled out like questions on e-cigarettes. So they'd pick a question out of the raffle, like the gold thing right there, and ask their peer the question, and then they would go through a pamphlet and then answer the question. Um, the upper left, they did their passing on information on substance use, and then they had the activity where they did like a Jeopardy style where students had to answer questions about marijuana and how to deal with stress in healthy ways. The bottom left is a poster that they created for uh, nicotine or vaping e-cigarettes. And then the bottom left is them getting trained. So now I'm going to the next slide. So now I'll talk about student engagement online which is post COVID-19. Um, we still met weekly on Zoom and definitely encountered a lot of challenges. Many students were trying to adjust to the new online lifestyle as well as balance home life. Students who were able to go to school and dedicate time to our program were now full-time students and also full-time caretakers for their siblings while their parents worked, or they would simply just get their phone taken away because they got in trouble. So it was hard to stay connected sometimes. Um, holding students accountable became tougher. I had to use my best judgment when it came to whether or not they should have money removed from their stipend. I offered ways for students to make up their absences by taking the lead on specific campaigns or leading the conversation in Zoom meetings. Also, in order to avoid Zoom fatigue, because I did see this was a question, I tried to dedicate some meetings to just having fun. We were able to play charades on Zoom and the students, honestly, I was really surprised at how much fun that they had. Um, the way it worked was like, I would send a student a private message and the student would act whatever I sent. So if I sent them an elephant, they would act it. They obviously have to have their video cameras turned on. If your students don't feel comfortable with the video cameras turned on, my students were very wishy-washy. Sometimes they were cool with it and sometimes they weren't. Um, they actually came up with an idea to just like hum a song or say the lyrics to a song and then they would all try to guess. Um, as for campaigns and events, since the students had already started their Instagram, we decided to use that as our main way to run them. First, we had to focus on gaining followers. They didn't have very many followers because we had just started our Instagram. And the way that we did that was we put in our bio that followers could win a $25 gift card to Nike if just for following us. And then we went on a following spree and the students followed all of their friends and then the, the hope was that the students would see that we were following them, click it, go to our profile, and see that we were giving away money, and then they'd want to follow us. Uh, it was pretty successful. I think we went from like 100 followers to 250, 295, something like that. And then once we had a solid follower base, uh, we had to become very familiar with Instagram and Instagram stories and all of that and how to interact with our audience. So that's the picture I included over here is just the options that you have when you're using Instagram stories. So I like to use the Instagram stories for just general interaction. So this is just asking them relevant questions about health, um, like just questions that they have themselves because there is an option for them to ask you questions as well. Um, recently, I asked my students how they felt about the protests happening in LA and the murder of George Floyd. Um, just to give them a space to share their feelings and uh, talk about that and kind of <laughs> form community. And so not only are stories great for interaction, but they're also great for challenges. We did a quarantine check, which is just a check-in with their peers, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, you can also use this really cool quizzes feature and the polls feature. The quiz feature allows you to ask um, a question or make a statement and the student can answer with the A, B, or C. And I believe it tells them the, the correct answer. So when they're participating, they're actually learning something. 
I also like to use the poll feature. It gives you two op or gives students two options. So I'll use that for like a myth and fact, uh, I guess, quiz type thing. We recently did it on birth control, myths and facts. So it would be like condoms are the only effective way to prevent teen pregnancy. And the student will answer truth or fact. And then whichever student answered and got them all right, um, they win a $25 gift card. So that kind of incentivizes them to participate. We actually got a lot of participation in that. That one was really, a really successful um, way to educate their peers. And then the second feature I'll talk about is posts. So this is just like your general Instagram post. Um, so what the students did with that was they curated their own posts. So each student would do a specific birth control method or an STD. Um, and recently they did like a thank you healthcare workers where each one was, or essential workers, not healthcare workers. Uh, so each student would do like sanitation workers or grocery store clerk, something like that. Um, so it's great for them to really, you know, do something that's their own. And they use Canva for that. Um, the second way you can use posts is just for advertisement. So you advertise your challenges, your Instagram lives, your quizzes, whatever you're doing that week, you can just post it. It's great for that. And then you can share your posts on your story. So that's pretty cool too. Another way you can utilize posts is having their peers DM you posts that uh, they want to see. And we also used it to create solidarity around Denim Day, which was spreading awareness about sexual violence. So if students um, wanted to state that they were standing in solidarity with victims of sexual violence, they just DM us a picture of, wearing, of them wearing denim. And then on Canva, we added like the little denim day banner, which is the picture that I have over here. And then the third feature is Instagram Live. So, so I'll also talk about that on one of the next slides is a really successful way the students were able to reach out to their peers. Um, it's just a way to share information and play games. And then lastly, there's uh, Instagram TV. If you want to post a really long video, um, that's great for that. We made like a TikTok video where the students were passing a water bottle and it was too long for Instagram. So it just automatically made it Instagram TV post. So that was nice of Instagram to do. And now I'll go to the next slide. So this is our Instagram Live. It's a picture of my two students, Melanie and Christina. So the first thing that we did was we chose our health topic. The health topic they chose was HPV. Um, after they chose their topic, I asked students to volunteer because not everybody wants to be showing their face online on, on social media. I was surprised. I was like, don't you guys love social media? Um, so yeah, Melanie and Christina, volunteered and then after they volunteered they developed a script of what they were going to say um, i read the script fact checked it make sure all the information was accurate i usually tell them to only um, use planned parenthood when it comes to stds hpv birth control methods um, just to make sure that the source is credible um, and then another student actually volunteered to create the questions from the facts that the, um, the students came up with and then after that, you advertise your event through posts, your stories, stuff like that. And then the students, we would schedule a Zoom call just to practice beforehand. So um, just to give more specifics about what happened, Melanie started the Instagram Live and then Christina came and joined later because you can request to join in an Instagram Live to have two people. They both shared lots of facts about HPV. They repeated it multiple times because people you know, come in and out. Um, and then once they felt like they had enough people, they started the game. So for the game, what they did was they told their peers to send an emoji if they were going to participate. Uh, they wrote their name down and then they started asking the quiz questions. So they'd be like, how many people are infected with HPV each year? And then somebody would answer and whoever answered first with the correct answer would um, get the point and whoever had the most points at the end won. So I believe you'll be getting the slides after I included the links to the Instagram lives for you guys to look at if you just wanted to watch them and see how they went and how the students ran their game. So that is our Instagram live. And then next we have our quarantine check story challenge that one of my students created. I 
they came up with the idea and I tried to like make a Canva and they told me that's lame and then they <laughs> remade it for me. So this is what they uh, uh, decided to come up with. And so basically this is just kind of, this is more about self care. Um, and it was at the beginning of when the pandemic began and everybody was being quarantined. So they wanted to check in with their peers, ask them how they feel and then kind of share how they were self-caring so then their peers can see how to self-care and like what other uh, best ideas and best practices there are around that. Um, the two on the sides are two that some students submitted. The important part I think about the story uh, challenge is the rules, like including the rules on it. So they have to fill out and share and then they tag and follow our account so that way we know that they posted and that we can see it because uh, oftentimes we'll follow them back and then if they're private they'll tag us we won't be able to see it but if we follow each other we'll be able to see it um, and then on the bottom make sure that they know that if they participate they can win some money it incentivizes them, incentivizes them further to actually participate and then they also can nominate three friends so this is a really cool easy way for the students to build community and share practice, best practices around self-care. Um, so I just have some final tips for you, for you all. Um, I would suggest make existing trends and challenges your, challenges your own. And an example of that would be there was this like pass the makeup brush challenge where a bunch of beauty gurus were passing a makeup brush and it would go to one person to the next. And instead of doing makeup brush, we did water bottles and they would post like a, a fact about drinking water. So that was a really cool video. We did it across all of our student advisory boards. So it was myself, my two sites, um, and Mackenzie, who will be talking to you guys next at Crenshaw. I also suggest for you all to link with other school-based org social medias. So for example, I am at Jordan High School. Jordan High School has multiple uh, social media outlets like Educare, which is their after school program, BAN, student government. So, and then DMing them whenever you want them to, um, I guess, elicit more of their students to participate in the challenges. They will help you. I haven't had a bad experience yet where someone ignored me and didn't want to share my post. Um, and I also learned that students react best to videos and pictures of their peers. Uh, they always get a lot of comments, likes, they're, and they're fun. I like, to, I like to see my students also making these videos and stuff. Um, and things that they can participate in easily that don't require a lot of commitment. So some of these things would be the story challenge that I'm showing you all right now, um, as well as an Instagram Live. Both of these things don't require the students to take up any of their social media real estate because, you know, they care about their aesthetic, they care what people think about them. These things can get posted and then they just disappear the next day. Um, some things that I found that found didn't work were challenging students to recreate TikToks. TikTok is a big thing right now. Um, they love TikTok, but not a lot of them actually make TikToks. They'll just go on TikTok and scroll. So it'd probably be better if you're interested in working with TikTok, having your students create the TikTok and then posting it for other people to see but it's not great for engaging with other students and trying to get them to participate in a challenge. Also, what doesn't work are posts with a hashtag. So saying like, oh, if you post a picture of your healthy meal for today and put a hashtag of healthy living or something like that, they don't wanna participate in that. Cause like I said before, it'll probably ruin their Instagram aesthetic. Um, and yeah, maybe it's not that cool to be like, I'm healthy. So yeah, those are just the things that I've learned throughout this whole um, pandemic. And next we will go to Mackenzie so she can share her experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, hello, everyone. So Danielle and I do um, similar work. So <laughs> some of um, what we're sharing may overlap, but that's okay. So um, how I started my slides was just to give you all the what. Um, so as Danielle mentioned as well, I run a student advisory board at Crenshaw High School. 
Um, so what do we do, right? So we have our weekly meetings. Um, we focus on health topics. Students get trained. Um, we do lunch campaigns, classroom presentations, and PA announcements. Um, so on our end, what that looks like for us is um, I actually came into uh, Crenshaw in October. Um, so I was I actually walked into a group already. So my startup looked a little different. I was fortunate to have a somewhat established group already. Um, but with that, we made tweaks along the way. So we meet once a week on Wednesdays. That was the day that the students, uh, most of the students I have in my group, they're involved in multiple programs on campus. Um, so they pick Wednesday after school. Uh, so some, some days our meetings will last a good hour and a half. Um, it will really just depend on if we have a lunch campaign that week. Oh, give me one second. I see someone saying they can't see the slides. Um, is there, is, can you guys see the slides? I just got a message saying folks can't see the slides. It's visible. It's, okay. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we will meet at the school. Um, like I said, our meeting times will be an hour and a half, um, sometimes two hours, depending on if we have a campaign, a scheduled campaign that week, um, or depending on if we have a training. So on the days when we do have training, um, our meeting times will probably last a good two hours. Um, because a lot of times we have the training at the beginning and then um, we have probably debrief a little bit. Um, we might have other agenda items to discuss during that time. Um, also, when we do have scheduled campaigns during the week, um, I'll check in with my students throughout the week. So sometimes I might see them during their advisory period. Um, sometimes students will drop in during lunch and that's also other opportunity for me to connect with my students. Um, to talk about what's happening in their life and at school, um, our health campaigns and prepare. Um, so when we do, um, so we have five campaigns that we focus on right now. We actually just added mental health. Um, so we do two pays, what's up, HPV, STDs, and HEAL. Um, so with those campaigns, students will get trained over all of those health topics. Um, and then we will work around to see and then we will go into our scheduling, right? So what day works for us? What time do we wanna do our campaigns? How are we gonna prepare? Um, and, and we also align with what's happening nationally, um, as Danielle mentioned as well. So this previous month, um, you had Mental Health Awareness Month, you had Teen Pregnancy Prevention Month. Um, so that's what that will look like. Also, classroom presentations. Um, <laughs> we have classroom presentations scheduled um, actually the same week that we went on quarantine. So my students were so sad about that. They were really excited and pumped up to present. Um, they were do, they were scheduled to do an STD and birth control presentation, um, but it didn't happen. So we're gonna have to <laughs> figure that out later. Um, so more about the logistics. So like I said, we'll pick a time and a day that works for the students, um, depending on how prepared we are, when, we, when students receive the training, um, and then oftentimes I assign them tasks. Um, so I'll have students volunteer who's gonna um, do setup, who's gonna do cleanup. Um, some certain students would get in groups and create posters, um, either posters to post around the school just to promote our campaigns um, or just really to promote health. Um, a lot of students created posters um, to advertise the wellness center, some of the services, um, our group. So they would do that. Um, I also have students that will um, volunteer to maybe take notes or um, be the person to hold the rest of the students accountable. So just depending on what's going on, um, some students will be assigned to making sure all the snacks are out, um, making sure we have certain incentives. As Danielle mentioned during our campaigns as well, we give out um, little knickknacks we might have um, pencils, t-shirts, gift cards, um, and definitely snacks. 
Um, we, we try to stay on the healthy side, but as I've learned, you know, a lot of students, they're, they see granola bars and they're like, nah, we wear the chips, miss, you know? So um, it's very rare that we give, we might give out some candy or there were some times we had um, like famous, famous cookies and the students went crazy over that. Um, and then resources are always a, a big deal. So when, when I'm prepping the students and we're having these conversations, I'm always uh, refer them to certain websites to make sure that the information that they're getting um, is credible. Also, um, our wellness center on campus is a big resource. Um, I'm putting, um, our Healthy Start Navigator is a part of our team at Crenshaw. So she joins our meeting. She also um, is there to provide a lot of resources for us. Our PSW is involved on the mental health side. So she's there if she catches any um, red flags with our students and she supports the students with uh, referral systems and things like that. Um, so just making sure they have those resources. A lot of times at the beginning when I first met with my students, um, I gave them all binders. So with like notebooks and a pen and a list of resources that they can go to um, for additional support if they need services. Um, and then I, I made a note here, bullet point for expected outcomes. So when, when we're planning, we, we, we know a lot of the students uh, may not come to our table during lunchtime, but we at least hope and plan for um, 50 to 60 students to visit our table during lunchtime. And some of these um, pictures that you see on the slide are actually some of our campaigns that we hosted um, during lunch. So typically, I think the most students we had come to our table during lunch was around like 90 students, which was awesome uh, because we didn't expect that many. But uh, the more campaigns we did on campus, we were able to adjust. So um like later on we were able to get a speaker so we played music to attract more students um a pa announcement helped because they do PA, PA, uh, pa announcements every day during advisory so that was helpful for us to connect with like the college center um, and some other organizations on campus just to help us promote um, we might, like I said, hand out flyers and whatever incentive we may have that we feel students um, that would attract students. We just tried all different methods just to see what worked. And, and most recently, before we went um, on quarantine, the, the music and we had like a will that you guys could see the students were participating in all types of activities and all of this is student led. Uh, so I, I'm just there and I support the students, but I, I like to take a step back and, and just see where they take it, see how they engage with their peers, see what information they put out there, um, and just really support them as I build their capacity, especially their leadership capacity. Um, so that's some of what our um, work looked like before we went on quarantine, just to talk a little bit about the pictures, as I mentioned, um, these pictures were from some of our lunch campaigns. The one at the bottom right, um, I believe we that was from Kindness Week. Um, so we actually merged Kindness Week with a little bit of mental health. So as I mentioned, we had our, P, our PSWs involved in our group. Um, so she was able to bring a lot of resources um, for Kindness Week and anti-bullying. Um, and we infused a little bit of mental health in there. Um, at the top right, I believe that was a campaign for STDs. So um, those pamphlets we got from ETR, those were super helpful. And um, we also had the will that Danielle used in one of her campaigns. The student um, created a list of questions for true or false for, for other students to engage in. Um, if they got the answer correctly, they got a prize. Um, the other picture next to that one on the left is actually a photo from Y to Y. Um, I had students present during Y to Y, which is the youth to youth conference. Um, so it's just a space where students are able to come together and engage with other student advisory boards in LAUSD. Um, and they also get training and they have the opportunity to present and just hear from other students that's doing the work. Um, and then the bottom, left i believe that was from we did a tobacco um campaign so i think we did escape the vape and we just merged a lot of 
um, anything that had to do with tobacco and, and substance use, we kind of merged that all in one, um, just for our timeline at that time. So students really um, love that campaign. They, they, students created a pledge um, and had, went around to the whole school and had students signing this pledge to not vape, um, anti-tobacco, they had teachers involved. So that was really successful. The students had fun doing that. Um, and on the next slide, um, on here is more so during quarantine. Um, so like I mentioned, we had multiple classroom presentations scheduled um, and then we had to go on quarantine. So um, immediately it, we had to adjust and shift how we engage and it was quite challenging um, for myself and for my students, they were trying to figure it out. Um, so at the beginning, we, we could only do conference calls. Um, and as you can imagine, getting <laughs> 10 teenagers on the phone, you know, it, 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 it was definitely difficult. Um, but I applaud my students because they showed up and they called in the number, they were on time, um, they participated on the call, but I definitely felt um, a disconnect there. My students expressed that. They were like, why do we have to sit on this phone? You know, I'm trying to hold these conversations and, and talk about what's happening with my students um, on a phone without seeing them. We have no connection at all. Um, they did not like that at all. They asked me every day, when can we do Zoom? When can we see each other? Um, I'm tired of talking on the phone, miss. You know, this is boring. Um, but that's what we had to do at the time because LAUSD was like, mm, um, let's just do conference calls for now. We're not too sure about the Zoom. Um, so when we were able to um, transition over to Zoom, we got the green light to do that. It totally changed um, how, how we engaged. I mean, the students were more open. They felt more connected because they were able to see, see each other. Um, so with that, with Zoom, I was able to share my screen. I was able to talk through and, and the students were actually able to see what I was talking about um, with the share screen feature. So we went through different PowerPoints. I was able to show them how to navigate like through Canva and, and certain websites where they can pull um, information and resources for their different campaigns. Um, and so we still met weekly. Um, our, when we met with our conference call, the calls will probably be um, an hour, 15 minutes or so, just depending on what we we're talking about and we were still trying to adjust. Um, and then we were able to transition to Zoom. Um, our calls got longer because now we had the platform where I'm actually, I'm actually able to show my students more information um, and, try, and attempt some sort of training. Like I mentioned, our students got received training over their campaign. Um, so it was just a great refresher for them. So I was able to go through the PowerPoint slides. We were able to refresh, ask questions and engage in that way. Um, and move into social media. So social media is big right now, right? This is like all we have. Um, so honestly, before quarantine, um, our social media wasn't that active. Um, we were just starting our page up. Um, we were just trying to get some followers, get some content going. Um, and I think we had maybe like 30 followers. Uh, so I actually tried the method that Danielle showed earlier about just going to uh, her students who's following her students, following them and hopes for them to follow back. And we tried it and actually, um, it actually worked. So we went from like 30 followers and I think now we have 104. Um, so not where exact, I would love to have more followers, but we're getting there. Um, so just building content with that. So what I found, so again, with the students, as I would assign them tasks in person, I did the same thing um, virtually. So in this case, for example, uh, the most recent thing was Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, so the students were assigned to uh, a mental health disorder. So each student kind of researched different mental health disorders um, and they picked which one they wanted to research further. So they did that and created, um, they used Canva as well, and created this little like info sheet just explaining uh, what their mental health disorder is, treatment, um, they shared different resources for that. And they enjoyed doing that. Um, 
So that was actually a success for us. And some of the challenges in contests, we tried um, like TikTok challenges, as Danielle mentioned as well, um, engaging students that wasn't the best method for us. However, um, the students that are part of my student advisory board, they love doing TikTok videos. Um, so these are actually some videos down here and I'm gonna include the link so you guys can all um, go check them out. But they love doing that. Um, I had students did one for self-care. I had a student do one um, most recently actually for June, which is um, Fresh Fruits and Veggies Month. Um, Students did TikToks for um, for the Hill campaign, Healthy Eating, Active Living. That was really successful. So they love doing the TikTok videos, but just getting other students to engage in, and recreate their videos, that definitely was a challenge. Um, but we tried, right? Um, going on to the Instagram story. So that is that has been where we've seen our most engagement um, on our story. So posting questions and, and quizzes and polls um, and, and just getting students to click. It's just a simple click. They see a question, they can answer it. Um, they see a poll or true and false. We also use the, the fact or fiction, um, myth or truth um, strategy. And that's where, we, well, that's where we've seen a lot of our engagement. And that was great. Um, so I knew that worked. So I tried to do that more often. And um, along with the story, just general posts, so just posting content. Uh, so a lot of times I'll, I'll have uh, the students created a social media calendar. Uh, so each day of the week, they picked which day they wanted and uh, what day they wanted to represent. So for example, Monday, my students were like, let's do Motivation Monday. You know, we're quarantined. It's a lot happening right now. Um, let's do that. So we had some students do Motivation Monday. Um, for Friday, my students were like, oh, we can do something with STD family planning. Um, so they chose to do that. So each day of the week, they would send me content to post. Um, and a lot of times they would send it to me a few days before um, or even the week before. So it came to a point where I had so much content, um, it made it real easy for me to post every day. Um, and with the social media calendar, with the students who volunteered uh, for Monday, Tuesday, whatever day of the week, um, I'll check in with them prior to. So some of my students who were uh, um, who selected Friday for family planning, I'll check in with them um, on Wednesday or maybe even Thursday just to make sure they have some content um, to see where I can support them if they wanted to do anything different. Um, and they enjoyed that. And we also would align, like I mentioned before, we also align it with the national campaigns that are going on. So sometimes we will actually put a pause to our social media calendar um, to focus on some of the larger campaigns that are, ha that are happening. Um, and hi, yeah, the Mackenzie. videos, like our, yeah. Mackenzie, hi, it's Sierra. Um, I was just hoping maybe you could wrap it up a little bit so that we can get to San Ysidro, please. Yes, yeah, sure. 15 minutes left, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, no problem. And then, um, so the next slide is just included some student quotes. So I took the time to just ask my students um, how they're feeling, um, how they felt before quarantine, after quarantine, um, how they feel what's happening in the world. We also had a conversation about George Floyd. Um, I posed um, questions about that on our story and we got feedback from that. Um, and then the next slide is just some recommended resources that I shared with students, the IG accounts, um, or just like our wellness center, Planned Parenthood, we always go to there um, for resources. And I just listed some numbers that um, our students are, are using for resources and that they share with their peers or even their families. Um, and the next slide is student voice. Danielle? So for the student voice, I'll go ahead and send uh, a question and answer in the chat so you guys can read it. And then we will move on to San Isidro. Great. Thank you so much, LA Trust, um, for that wealth of information. Um, so, um, folks, I know we um, are a little short on time. Um, and so you do need to um, log off by that, too. That's okay. Um, again, just want to remind everyone that this webinar 
is recorded and will be posted on our website. Um, however, we do encourage you um, to stay on um, for as long as you can to hear um, more about Fantasy Grow. Um, so, um, real quickly, um, we're joined by a very illustrious panel um, from Fantasy health. Um, so um, first we're joined by Angelica Barajas. Um, she is a health educator and, and has done um, extensive work um, in human sexuality for about five years now um, and has done a lot of work in uh, reproductive justice and youth empowerment. Um, we're also joined by Jessica Beltran um, who is also a health educator and her work focuses mostly on adolescence and sexual health. Um, and uh, finally we're joined by Ashley Rojas, um, also a health educator. Uh, she recently graduated from San Diego State um, in uh, 2019 um, and studied public health. Um, she, uh, I'm really excited uh, to uh, work in the public health field um, with San Diego Health uh, and also work with uh, a population that she knows um, will benefit from her um, perspective and experience. Uh, so with that, I will hand it off to Sammy Cedro Health. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Um, can someone please pass me the um, option so that I can navigate the PowerPoint, please? I think earlier we were using uh, pass, pass over, passing the ball, I believe it was called. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Angelica Barajas, and I am with um, San Isidro Health. I'm joined with my coworkers, Jessica Beltran and Ashley Rojas. Thank you so much for folks who uh, are able to stay on. Uh, like Peter mentioned earlier, this is being recorded, so the information will get passed along. And thank you, Ellie Trust, for all the great um, information that you shared today. So just very briefly, um, we work for an organization called San Isidro Health. Um, I won't be going too much information about the organization as a whole. Um, the department that myself, Jessica, and Ashley work at is the Adolescent Health Department, and we help promote uh, the teen clinic. Um, so teen clinic opened uh, the summer of 2011, and we provide reproductive health services for folks between the ages of 12 years old to 24 years old. Um, reproductive health services include things like um, pregnancy testing, pregnancy options, STI testing, uh, birth control, and um, 101 health education. So if folks, um, youth or students um, want to learn more about um, birth control or STIs or consent, how to talk to their partner or partners, how to talk to their family or trusted adult, um, were there for, for their assistance. Um, we also provide uh, referral outs for mental health and other well-being uh, education. We also teach, um, aside from having one-to-one -one, um, health education with our, with our youth or patients, we also go out to a variety of middle schools and high schools in the South Bay. Uh, we're located in San Diego, um, and we focus on the high schools and middle schools that are closest to um, the border, because uh, San Isidro is a border town to Tijuana, Mexico. Um, so we focus with all the middle schools and high schools um, around the area, the South Bay area, and we help teachers and school districts implement the sex education curriculum. Um, so when teachers need assistance, they give us a call and we set up those presentations for, for uh, the students. We also have a um, high school internship uh, program called Your Health Advocate. Kit, uh, program and this allows the students to learn a little bit more in detail of reproductive health, um, get the opportunity to um, get engaged and involved with our social media. So they work very closely with the social media team and also it helps us kind of help them advocate for themselves, advocate for their peers, and if they're hearing any um, misinformation out in their classrooms in regards to reproductive health, mental health, um, well-being, or just anything. Um, they, the peer health advocates, kind of already have the information and the tools to kind of help clarify any misinformation that may be spreading, especially with social media. We all know information spreads very fast. 
and a lot of information. So our PHAs in short um, help us out with that. And we also promote Teen Clinic and our services uh, via school and community outreach. Um, so every month we go to a variety of high schools during their lunch and we promote Teen Clinic. Um, so a, a variety of us health educators will go out there so folks, students um, see our faces, become familiar with their faces um, in case they see us or set an appointment for one-to-one -one health education um, at Teen Clinic. And we also promote um, the services uh, via our social media and our website. Today we're going to focus a little bit about um, our social media and I will pass it to Jessica. Thank you, Angelica. Um, so, Teen Clinic services during COVID-19. So, in mid-March of 2020, the Teen Clinic physical location had to close because of COVID-19. And this is when we, San Diego Future Health as a whole, began the rollout of telehealth as, as well as we did, the Teen Clinic. Um, one thing that was extremely helpful for the Teen Clinic was having a teen friendly number available for our patients to get in contact with us, either through calls or through text from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now this number, we had already been um, promoting it even before COVID. So our patients were aware of this number and they were able to call this number. And our health educator, Ingrid, um, is the one who is in charge of the phone and is in charge of setting up the health education session. Um, so she's also a familiar face that our patients are um, know of. So all of our health education sessions are now via telehealth. And if a patient needs an in-person service, for example, if they need to get an implant inserted, then they, the health educator will direct the patient to our closest open clinic because um, just an overall, San Diego Future Health is a healthcare organization with different clinics all over San Diego. So the Teen Clinic um, location is one of them, but we also have several other locations that did remain open during COVID. So we would send the patients to a new to another clinic. Um, and now, because we are sending patients to new clinics, we're not as um, in control of what the other clinics are doing and other, unfortunately, other clinics aren't really aware of minor consent laws. Um, so it is important for our health educator and our staff to build rapport with our patients and emphasize minor consent laws. So Ingrid does a really good job of letting our patients know that they have the right to go to a clinic um, and have confidential service without their parents knowing. And she also lets them know if they have whatever issue um, or if they have any issue, then to call back to the number and we will um, help them out in which any way we can. Um, and the social media, the social media team also works really closely with Ingrid and with the Teen Clinic supervisor to make sure that all this information is being released um, to our patients. And because our usually our main, um, like I think I was saying, we would go out to the schools, right? We would be in presentations, we would be doing outreach, giving all of this information. Um, but now we we're not. Now we're only offering the presentations virtually or pre-recorded, um, and we're kind of focusing a lot on social media and doing things virtually. Next slide. Okay. So since everything has gone pretty much virtual, um, obviously I think the big thing from COVID is a lot of focus on social media and telehealth and everything, what, whether it's virtual recordings for presentations. Um, so this is just a brief little overview of our social media team. As you can see, there's three members total today. We actually have four, um, but one is on maternity leave. So we have more of a structure to our social media um, end of things just to make sure that each week uh, we meet those goals and make those posts. So we have three Instagram posts weekly. Our first one is called like Question Tuesday. Our second one is Traveling Condom Wednesday. And our third is THA Thursday. And I put some little examples of pictures up. You can see the Traveling Condom in the 
bottom like corner, um, a PHA. So that was the peer health advocate. And then as well as a question Tuesday post, and this one's um, really relevant to COVID. So even though our um, overall teen clinic is focused on sexual and reproductive health for youth, we want to make sure our Instagram is an overall view of all things we think youth should know about. Um, so another thing we do with those Instagram posts weekly, uh, we'll make sure to have like monthly themes. So I know um, LA Trust just mentioned Mental Health Awareness Month, like we'll keep those in mind when it comes to um, planning our posts, things like that. We'll make sure if we don't want to put too much uh, focus on COVID, let's do something a little lighter. Let's focus what the theme of the month is. And this really helps navigate how our posts are now, um, creativity wise and everything like that. Instagram stories is a huge one. Uh, LA Trust gave a lot of great examples and tips. We do almost everything like that too whether it's the polls, whether it's interactive stories, sometimes we'll do facts about things that may be too lengthy for an actual Instagram post. Um, we'll leave the little question box for like our followers to interact with us. And then something we also just started doing with COVID-19 is Instagram lives as another more casual way to interact with the youth. Um, so with our Instagram lives specifically, we'll have a different theme each week. So it's, on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. And we'll always have two health educators interacting in the Instagram lives together. One will be almost as a moderator, the other will be the host. So this way one person can always navigate questions from people asking, and then you can also put links to the Instagram lives and things like that, or like numbers to call. So just a little overview of us. And you can go to the next slide. And then, so when I said themes for each month, these are more examples. So whether it's Pride Month, um, National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, or even Black History Month, um, we'll make sure to go with the themes for each month. So now um, with COVID-19, we used to have monthly meetings to plan out all our posts since we were in the office and everything like that. But now since everything has gone virtual, we'll do weekly Monday meetings. And this way we can like kind of gather ourselves for the week, maybe things going on um, in the world, um, what we want to focus on, maybe we don't want to focus on. So this week uh, we actually took a little lighter um, post to Instagram. We didn't so much focus on Pride Month. We kind of focused on the Black Lives Matter just because that is something that we think is important to also highlight. and. It's going on all over social media. So we really just things like that kind of be aware those weekly meetings really, really help. And we always keep track of numbers. So this is just an example of what we would present to like our team who isn't involved in social media. Um, we'll track our followers for each month. So for our May numbers, it's 930 followers. We created 12 posts and, and our average like 42 likes. The nice thing I also posted on this slide, it's a little hard to see because it's blurry, um, but when you have like say a business account or a health account or things like that and it's public, you're able to see insights. So this is really awesome if you just like, whether it's Instagram story views, I'm able to tell who, um, who what demographic is viewing our posts who our majority of followers are, what age range. Um, I can see what hours per what day of the week they'll like the post the most. So this is a really, really interesting way to kind of navigate like, oh, maybe I'll post on Wednesdays more often because there's more viewers at 5 p.m. So that's a really great way too. And you can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a picture of what our social media looks like, um, just to kind of show you the layout of it um, in case you're not familiar with Instagram. Um, I know most of us are, but just in case. Um, and this kind of shows you. Um, it ended up working out pretty cool because it looks like all on the, the picture to the right that's showing more photos. Um, the first row, it's showing all of the content that we post, um, our PHA post. Um, so this is where our youth gets really involved and creates um, content for us, whether it is a video, a TikTok video, 
um, a little um, collage or sometimes we like to do some lighter, um, less um, information dense posts of just asking like, what's the song of the month or COVID playlist or something. And then in the middle is our traveling condom post. Um, so right now during COVID, um, since um, we're not able to engage out in the world um, before COVID, um, we would ask health educators if they would go on any trips, do any type of community outreach um, to carry a, our red um, traveling condom and take a photo. Um, now during COVID with social distancing, we're kind of just utilizing um, TV shows um, related to the services or content that we promote. Um, and we kind of just do a little um, cool little facts there. And then the third row is showing all of the question Tuesdays. So a little bit on how we engage um, with the youth online. Uh, we'll be covering about four topics, um, meeting youth where they're at, incorporating the youth, at collaborating with other organizations, and um, how to or building a social media team. So meeting youth where they're at. Um, we like to keep the content relevant. I think um, my team and I kind of have an advantage because we work directly with the youth, um, whether that's with our PHAs um, or going into the classrooms, presenting um, lunch outreach, um, and we're, we're able to kind of, <laughs> they kind of keep us young, if you will, right? So we're aware of any trends that they may be in, into, music that they're into, what kind of conversations are they having, um, questions that they ask during classroom presentations in regards to um, sexual health. Um, so we, we kind of keep, we're taking notes. As we're engaging with the youth, we're taking notes and just making sure that we kind of relay that on our Instagram. Um, on Instagram, we're talking a lot about Instagram. We also have Facebook, um, but we've kind of noticed overall um, the most engagement that we see so far um, is with Instagram. So we do focus more on Instagram. We do cross post from Instagram at, uh, to Facebook, um, but most of our interaction is solely focused on Instagram. Um, so we do have our direct messages, also known as DMs, open, um, just in case if any of our followers um, sends us a message, also on Facebook. So we make sure we look at those every day. Um, sometimes youth does reach out to us and ask us questions like, oh my goodness, I had condomless sex and I'm worried I may um, be pregnant. What do I do? And so we get those messages directly. Right away, we'll give them the resources that they may need. Um, so in this case, we'll give them the teen clinic phone number, let them know that that number they can call or text, whatever they feel comfortable with doing, um, and our health educator, Ingrid, will get a hold of them. Um, they can also ask anonymous questions on our website, and our website is linked on our Instagram bio, um, along with our phone number. Um, we also like asking our audience for feedback, and we tend to do this more on our Instagram stories, um, just to kind of see where they're at, if they're liking the content, or if they're in, even engaging in the questions that we're asking. Um, like I said before, we meet the students um, during um, class presentations. This is something we're doing more before COVID. Now during COVID, um, we're really relying on um, Instagram Lives. So Instagram Lives are kind of replacing the in-person presentations. We're doing that now online, um, like Jessica mentioned earlier. And then um, that'll give students the opportunity if, um, say, their teacher is still implementing the sex education curriculum online that has been modified for teachers just to upload as an activity for the students. So um, we had a live on birth control, um, minor consent laws. Today it's going to be about gender and sexual orientation. So this will give um, students the opportunity just to kind of refresh information that they may need just in case if they have any um, classroom work um, to be completed. We also like uh, just to keep in mind and making sure that we are empowering the youth um, so just, again, making sure that we're trying, um, maintaining to be interactive with them, um, whether it's through Instagram stories, the comment section, um, the DMs. Uh, we also like to give out accessible resources and information. Um, so whether it's 
plugging our teen clinic, the phone number, but we also realized that maybe not everyone has the means to maybe get to our location or the closest location that we have currently open. So we will shout out other community um, resources that they may need, whether it's for information on um, shelter, food, uh, mental health, um, or anything in regards to COVID if they're struggling or um, going through anything due to COVID, we make sure that our, our social media team is on top of um, any resources that are currently available now due to COVID. LGBT services also, um, we work close with the LGBTQ plus center in San Diego. There's a location in our neighborhood Hillcrest and also the South Bay Youth Center. Um, so we make sure that we're um, informed on any updates that they may have and we just spread that information resources um, as needed. And we also like to welcome um, the opportunity just to learn and to teach, right? Like, though we are the health educators, staff, the adults, right? Um, we also acknowledge that the youth teaches us a lot of things too. So we like to kind of keep that like, hey, let's learn and teach together. Um, and we do try to our best to kind of use the language that they're more familiar with. Uh, we do refrain from using, you know, curse words or bad words or anything like that. Um, but um, if for whatever reason, um, sometimes our posts will translate to Spanish and English. Um, we're still kind of working on that, on getting that across um, all of our posts and Instagram lives. Um, we do continue as health educators to use uh, medically accurate terms or terminology. However, if someone asks us a question and say maybe they use slang words, um, we'll, we'll, if we know what they're talking about, we'll kind of continue that conversation and then just kind of give them like, oh, um, that word, the medical correct term for this word is, you know, X. So if someone is saying, you know, a slang word like wee oui, wee, oui, then we'll say, oh, slang word for wee oui, wee oui, usually in the Latinx community is used um, for the medical correct term penis, just as an example. Okay, so um, like Angelica was mentioning, we really like to learn from youth. And one of the ways that we do this is by actually incorporating youth into our social media and into our teen clinic brand itself. Um, so I know we already mentioned this, we have a health, peer health education um, advocacy program um, that has two tracks, one that focuses on health education and the other that focuses on um, social media. So the social media track works with me and we build content, we create content for our social media um, because we really think that if you see people like them, they will be more inclined to follow and engage with our Instagram and also the youth are excited about the things that they're creating, right? So they're gonna um, put it on their stories, they're gonna put it on their Instagram and promote it to their friends, share it, um, and then their friends are, or peers are going to follow us and learn about our services. Um, so our PHAs again post on Thursdays, and it's really important again to keep the content relevant, and one of the ways to keep the content relevant is to is to work with youth because they know what's, what's, what are the current trends. Like we, we knew about TikTok, but I personally don't know how to use them, but our PHAs are masters at, at it. I don't even know how they do it half of the time. So that's why it's really important to incorporate youth and, and allow them to, to kind of give their feedback and their input. Um, next page, please. Okay, so collaborating with other organizations. Um, in our adolescent health department, there are other um, programs that also work with the youth. Um, so sometimes we'll collaborate with them, cross post, um, invite them to our Instagram lives. Um, we also like to follow other organizations that promote similar content or services, um, like Teen Clinic whether it's sex education, um, STIs, uh, mental health, um, community, um, grassroots community organizations. Um, we like to follow them. And if we see something really cool, relevant of the theme of the week or month, um, we'll repost. 
Um, and what's really important about reposting content, especially content that you're not creating yourself, is to tag or give credit um, where you receive where you're getting it from, right? Um, so sometimes if we repost, say for example, from Plant Parenthood, we'll make sure we'll tag them on the, the post itself. Um, shout them out and then encourage our followers, hey, check out their, their you know, their page. Um, we also like to use a lot of art um, that's already out there. So what we like to do, and this just kind of happens automatically, I feel, with my team. Um, we follow um, really cool um, different um, Instagram pages on our personal Instagram. Um, for example, I'm obsessed with um, Erica Hart. Um, their handle on Instagram is I Art, um, I Heart Erica, and they are a sex educator in New York City. Um, and their content is really, really cool. I follow them because I just like to nerd out. Um, and then I'm anything that's relevant, like, hey, our youth, I feel like, would really benefit from any information that they're promoting. Um, we make sure anything that we share, whether it's a post um, or story, making sure that we are tagging them and giving them credit. Um, we also like to repost information from any local organizations. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we work um, very closely with the South Bay Youth Center. It's a youth center for LGBT, excuse me, LGBTQ plus youth. Um, so we make sure um, any services that they have, especially right now during um, the pandemic, that we're, we're reposting um, and making that available for for our followers. Um, we also um, use the opportunity when reposting or interacting with other organizations uh, as the networking um, tool, right? So sending a DM or an email to an organization if we're interested in um, collaborating with them or vice versa. We've um, LA Trust reached out to us, right? Um, they sent out a DM and then we connected um, and here we are now. Um, we also um, will reach out to other local um, organizations as well. So these are just um, things to keep into consideration if you're thinking about building a social media team with your organization. Um, we strongly believe that members should genuinely enjoy social media and creating content. So, because um, that's gonna that that's gonna translate to the content, right? If if someone's not really interested or they're just doing it because it's they're getting paid for it, then it's not really gonna going to be effective for you. And also uh, something that I know me and my team do a lot, even though we do not promote um, off try, working off the clock, but if we see if we're scrolling down our Instagram, like Angelica was saying, and if you see a really cool post by someone you follow and you think, wow, this is going to be really good for our Instagram, then we just message it to our um, Instagram or book market and save it so that we can bring it up at our weekly meetings. Um, so our social media team is made up of about three or four members. We think three or four members are a pretty good number because if a few members are having creative blocks, then other members can come in and help pitch ideas. We're really good at collaborating with each other and asking each other, like, is this post okay? Did I write this caption right? Um, so we think that more than four, like if, if you keep it like a five or six, it'll just be too many people at the table but three or four is a pretty good number. And again, important to stay on top of trends or just um, important for people to have different experiences, right? So um, if I'm, I'm one person that has a different Instagram feed and I notice that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trend going on and then for, I don't know, maybe I'm heavy on notices, there's another trend going on. So, that, that's where we can collaborate and, and kind of see what are the different things going on in our different circles. Next slide, please. Okay, so as um, JB just said everything, pretty much just some quick tips on like social media in general, if you're super new, if you know like a little bit about it, but don't really know how to get started, um, exactly what you said before it is a team effort. So we originally had Jessica as the lead, the sole lead on social media for teen clinic in general. 
And she was even saying, it's really hard to try to put your, a lot of focus and creativity into leading that social media account, because think about it. Um, most of us wear many hats in our roles and our workplaces. Um, even if we may have one title, there's probably a lot of things we do. So thinking about taking on like such a big role, especially right now, um, when everyone's home, that could seem like a lot of work. So definitely having that team to support each other, bounce ideas off of, and just like talk out post through is really, really important. Um, just like she said before, make sure they're passionate in some way. They may not be interested in maybe posting on Instagram, but even if they are really creative or even follow accounts that are creative as well and have good uh, media, that even helps for the social media team to either repost, um, kind of mimic. Uh, a big thing we use is Canva. So Canva really helps. They already have um, a lot of good templates to use. So once you get the hang of it, at first you can be a little new to it and, and maybe not like it as much. You could add in your own pictures, change the background, fonts. They give you great, great templates. And that's what we use for majority of our things, whether it's Question Tuesday, um, even the traveling condom, all my Photoshop like comes from Canva. Uh, iMovie is a great source. We even incorporate um, the TikToks onto Instagram. So just like thinking about all the different uh, ways you can use it through different apps and make your Instagram even more creative. Um, and being flexible. Don't, I would say, don't stress yourself out too much with like, say you do try to create a structure, kind of like what we have three posts a week. We post our Instagram stories. Um, if you're just getting started, it really is trial and error. Like maybe you can see a post you do that isn't translating that well to your audience. And then you're like, okay, maybe I'll switch up like this instead. That is totally okay. Um, in the very beginning, we didn't have too much of a structure and it took us a while to get here. Um, also with like our team in general, like people will reach out to us last minute um, saying, can you please promote this on your Instagram? Like we want the youth to know. Um, that's where being flexible a little more comes into play. And just like in case there's things going on the, in the world, you have to change up your feed that happens. So I put two examples of like this week, what we posted on our Instagram stories with everything going on. Um, so just quick tips, uh, you can always reach out to other orgs um, on Instagram. Like say you really like an, an Instagram account and you're like, hey, like I really want feedback or anything like that. Don't be afraid to reach out because odds are they'll appreciate it so much that you even notice um, their account and hard work. So always reach out and always ask for help. You'll have a good, good thing going. And you can go to the next slide. So just to wrap up everything that we were um, saying in our presentation, again, team effort is definitely needed and engagement between the team members, um, keeping a structure like Ashley was saying, but also keeping it flexible, um, keeping it kind of in that middle where there's structure, but there's also room for flexibility. Um, like Angelica was saying, using relevant social media apps. Right now, we really focus on Instagram. We have a Facebook, but again, we don't. We only cross post. We don't really use it because our target population isn't on Facebook. It's mostly on Instagram. And we just recently started using TikTok because that's the new craze with with the youth. Um, like Angelica was saying, trying trying to keep language. Um, kind of appropriate for your specific youth population. Um, so not being too, too like professional, but trying to keep it a little bit more basic, but again, not using any type of like um, slang words or profanity. Um, and we really learned throughout the way that the less flyers and more humans there are, the more interaction there is. So people like seeing other people like themselves, people like seeing um, actual humans on the on the post on social media post. So the next slide was just going to be a video about one of our PHAs talking about their experience um, with youth engagement and being involved. Uh, but I'll just go ahead and link it on here. And if you want to watch it, feel free to watch it. And that's pretty much it for our presentation. If there's any questions, feel free to reach out 
um, to our any of our Instagram any of our Instagram or other social media accounts, and we will be happy to to connect. I forgot to mention earlier, I did mention we have a Facebook, we also have a Twitter and Snapchat. Um, we still regularly check them, though if we don't post comment, we still regularly check them just to see like our folks reaching out to us, our folks using it. Um, but so far, <laughs> Instagram seems to be the most popular with uh, among the youth. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you so much, Sandy Cedro Health. That was incredible and thank you for sharing um your wealth of knowledge um so just to be mindful of people's time i know um we're 20 minutes over um so if you do have any questions um we do have um our panelists contact information listed here um so feel free to uh, contact them directly for any questions that you may have uh, but other than that thank you all so much um for your participation. Um, again, this will be posted on our website um, within the next couple of days.